There we go. All right. Well, now that Liz had a had a last minute bit of excitement there, hopefully she's ready to to dive into her presentation on project planning. Hi, everyone. That was exciting. Wow. Um, I'm glad we got that out of the way at the beginning, right? Okay, I am going to share my screen with all of you. Um, pardon me, I am also doing a little bit of uh, work on the back end as the co or as the host of the Zoom meeting. All right, let's get started. Um, as Caitlin said, I have spent a lot of time in my life planning projects. Um, I've planned projects, I've planned film production, I've planned concerts, I've planned research projects. And so what I wanna share with you today are kind of like the core elements of planning that I found really helpful across all of those different types of projects. Um, and the things I found, the tips and tricks that have really, I feel like made uh, my planning successful across all of these different types of projects. Um, having said that, a lot of what I'm gonna share today um, I hope can be scaled up or down depending on how large or small your project is. Um, and also a lot of this is oriented towards a one-time project, though you can certainly apply it um, to an ongoing project as well. Uh, really, I'm, I wanna make sure that I'm sharing the basic components and you can modify them um, and make them what you want for your project because each project can be completely different. Um, so take what, you, what, take what serves you and you know, make it your own. So we are gonna talk a little bit first about what planning is, about the core elements of planning, uh, budget timeline, coordinating and tracking, and then just kind of ways of working. Um, so a little bit first, when I say plan, what I really mean and I'm talking about, um, sorry, I'm also admitting people, one second. Okay, so when I'm talking about planning, what I really mean um, is kind of the stage that happens after the ideation. So I'm kind of making some assumptions here um, as we talk about planning, that you have a core, you have your core idea of what you want to do, um, and that you've you know researched it a little bit, you've written about it, you've scoped it, and you have some goals. What we're going to be talking about today is kind of the second phase, um, which really again is about budgeting, timeline, coordinating, and tracking, and that of course feeds into the execution of your project. Uh, really, that's when you move things from being internal or for your team. Uh, to be more external into your community. Um, so that's when you really start looking for funding, you start promoting or doing outreach and implementing your project. And then lastly um, is the conclusion of your project. Again, this is oriented a little bit more towards a one-time project where you're going to evaluate, acknowledge and disseminate um, about the project. So this planning piece um, to me is probably as important as initiation. And I think it's really one of the core pieces um, of a project. Um, I think it really sets you up for success um, in the other two parts, the execution and the conclusion of your project. Um, and the other part about it too, is that it really is about how your project is going to happen. It really operationalizes your idea and makes sure that you can, you know, whatever you envisioned, you can make happen in, in real life. Um, I also think that this can be a little bit misleading um, and that we're looking at a really linear timeline of a project. Uh, projects aren't always linear. Um, and a lot of time planning has to happen um, throughout the execution and even the conclusion phases sometimes. Um, so that is to say that a lot of times you're gonna be returning to your plan throughout this. Um, however, the majority of your planning should be done in theory before execution and conclusion of your project. So, why should we plan and why do we not plan? So first and foremost, I think that a lot of times um, planning gets cut short um, in projects because it's oftentimes on or underpaid work, um, especially if you're, you know, your project is grant funded or you're looking for external funding. Um, one more second, okay. Um, if you're looking for external funding um, for your project, a lot of times um, the planning phase goes on un or underfunded. Um, that uh, oftentimes leads to a lot of reactive planning. Um, and oftentimes you don't have the time, for, uh, pardon me, the time resources, tools or practices you need to do planning effectively um, if you aren't being paid for it. So I wanna acknowledge that a lot of times that's why planning doesn't happen. It doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. It means that we have to um, make sure that 
planning, planning is still very important because ultimately it sets you up for success through in, in the other stages of your project. Uh, why should we plan? I think one of the biggest reasons for me when I talk to artists or I think about artists is fidelity. So you have a really strong vision of what you want to happen. And the way that you're going to best be able to make that a reality is to make sure that you're planning really well. That is to say that the idea that you have translates um, well into reality. Um, also, of course, impact. Um, if you're interested and if this is like an external project, let's say um, you know, you're creating a community event or whatever it may be, a lot of times planning will maximize your impact and make sure that you're reaching your goals. Um, next, preparedness and flexibility. I cannot tell you how many times I have talked to artists and the first or the most important piece of our conversation is that things are going to come up, um, plans are going to have to change and you need to be prepared and flexible. Um, planning makes it possible for you to be able to weather bumps in the road as they come up um, and make sure that you can stay on track even when that does happen. The next is accountability. Um, I believe that project planning not only makes you accountable to your project, but makes stakeholders accountable to your project um, and vice versa. Um, it really is a way to make sure that the, uh, the process is transparent and that everyone is on the same page in terms of their responsibilities and roles. Um, lastly, resources. Planning can help you maximize your time, money, et cetera, and make sure it's being used efficiently and effectively. Um, lastly, or pardon me, second to last, support. I think a well plan a well-planned project really demonstrates um, feasibility and really demonstrates that you know, you're being thoughtful and intentional. And when you have, whenever you go to ask for support, whether that be in-kind donations or volunteers, um, it really demonstrates to those folks um, that you know, it's likely you're going to be successful with your project. Um, and then lastly, um, I will say that um, for, for resources, I talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, but again, the idea that um, you're making the most of it, but really uh, what I wanted to focus on here is that you are a resource, your time is finite and your time is valuable. Um, so as you think about planning, you need to make sure that you're really considering your value and your worth and respecting your own boundaries. Um, I do wanna say that oftentimes, you know, plans happen, as I said, reactively earlier. Um, oftentimes they'll happen because of um, you'll find a grant opportunity um, or whatever it may be. But the reality is that the most effective plans um, are strategic. And that means that they happen before you really externalize the project. So the idea here is that we are really, this planning phase that we're talking about um, really is happening with you and your team. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the core elements of planning. They are budget, timeline, coordination, and tracking. So. Some tips and tricks, first and foremost, for budget. Um, so budgets are important for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because they are a moral document. It really shows what you're prioritizing or deprioritizing. You are putting resources towards certain things in your project, and that matters. Um, secondly, um, it really helps you scope your project. So oftentimes I find that people in the ideation phase um, are very ambitious, think really big. And by the time you get to your budget, this is often a kind of a reality check. Like, you know, you might have way too big of a scope. Um, and this is often the first time that people really realize that and realize that it's going to be helpful for them to uh, decrease or limit the scope of their project or focus in a little bit more. Um, because oftentimes we, you know, this is the point where the rubber hits the road and we start to understand what it really means in terms of resources. Uh, to bring that idea to life. Um, and then lastly, I will say, of course, that the budget really keeps you on track throughout your project. Um, we all have to worry about, you know, what we're spending versus what we're budgeting. Um, that is to say budget versus actuals. Um, and that this is really going to, as a living document, this will help you keep track of that. Um, having said that, um, we have some really important components of this. Uh, we're going to start at the very top, um, where it says version and date. So this might seem like something very small, but you're gonna notice this on all of the documents that I show you today. Something I think is very important for me has been keeping track of um, the version of documents and the last time they were updated. Now those can are, the version may or may not be important for you, but the date is certainly going to be important no matter what. 
So oftentimes I create different versions depending on when I send them out externally. So like, let's say you send out, you know, your first version of a budget to, um, I don't know, some sort of stakeholder, they give you feedback and you need to make revisions. So you're going to, of course, that's going to be the start of your second version. Um, and for me, a lot of times it's very important to keep track of those versions as they come in or as we make revisions. Uh, the other part of that too, of course, is the date. Um, I am feel, feel very adamantly at someone who's very detail oriented in planning um, that you make sure that the date is always kept, uh, that you're always keeping the date. Um, because oftentimes if you haven't touched a budget in a while and you go back to it, uh, you're not gonna remember like, oh, did I include that one small revision we made? Make sure that whenever you make a revision to your budget, you are revising the date. Um, having said that, um, I think there are some really core important components of the budget. So moving from left to right column wise, we have item rate amount total uh, description and notes. Item, I think we all know, um, that's going to be the thing that you're, <clears throat> pardon me, pricing out on that line. Um, rate, so in terms of personnel rate, um, that's what you set yourself. Um, I highly suggest that you um, look up Sria Conway's um, mapping out presentation on uh, how to price your work if you want to any more information on thinking about what you want to set uh, your own rate. Um, amount is obviously going to be the uh, either the amount of supplies or time. Um, amount is actually, I think, one of the most critical pieces and why it deserves its own column on this budget is especially for personnel. Again, this goes back to scoping. Oftentimes, I feel as though we underestimate the amount of time it's going to take us to do something. Making, you know, calling out this amount column really makes it so that you, you need to face or address how much time you're going to be spending on this project. Um, and then lastly, total is, you know, we're just multiplying rate, uh, rate times amount there. Description is really for um, external. It really helps people understand uh, either the role of that person or what that item is going to be doing um, in your project. And then on the far right hand side, the notes column, and this is why there's a big red line there, it's just for myself. Those are just the notes that I keep about those particular items. So what I find really important is for personnel, what I do is break down hours for each part of their job description. Because if you try and estimate time um, as a whole for a project that someone's going to be spending on it, it's very, very difficult. It really makes a whole lot of, it makes it much easier to you know, do um, kind of bite-sized pieces. And like I said, break it down by what their role is. And then you arrive at you know, the total amount of hours, which you will plug into um, the amount column. Um, for materials, equipment, and travel, um, what I tend to put in those notes sections are links to that particular item. Um, or I will say for travel, a lot of times it's to, um, for example, like here, it's for mileage. So I put in the link for uh, the IRS standard mileage uh, reimbursement. So I have, um, you know, I know where that came from and I have good proof of that. I do wanna say really quickly, especially for materials and equipment, whenever you're pricing those things out, I 100% encourage you to make sure that you're off, making sure you calculate shipping and calculating taxes and that. So that is to say, don't just like look up an item and find it on the Amazon page, like go to go all the way to your cart, go to checkout and see what kind of shipping and taxes that they're applying to that. Um, because prices can certainly start to get away from you. Um, if you don't include that. Um, uh, and then I do want to say really quickly um, that, you know, in terms of a budget, of course, we are looking at here, we're looking at um, a couple different sections. The most important ones obviously are personnel, materials, equipment, travel, and promotion. Um, I did add an additional uh, row here, which I, you know, it really depends on the budget that you're building. Um, but that is to say that if you need to call out evaluation or professional development or something else that doesn't necessarily fit under those other uh, rows, you can certainly create your own. So here I included professional development um, for, uh, for this made up project, uh, which you'll continue to see throughout the presentation. Um, and then lastly, I do wanna point out that of course at the bottom we have the uh, project expenses total. So those are the, the basic elements of the project expenses part of your, um, of your budget. When we look at, hold on, there we go. 
The next part, of course, is going to be project income. It has the same um, columns that we talked about before in terms of item rate, amount, total, description, and notes. Um, again, uh, those all kind of serve the same purposes that I talked about earlier. What really is important here is we're talking about the different rows. So here we have individual contributions, grants, in-kind donations. Um, and you wanna, of course, I'm anticipating that your project income is going to be equal to or more than your project expenses, because of course you should have a balanced budget. Um, but those are, I think that for me, uh, the most important things about budget, again, are in particular notes. And secondly, keeping it up to date. Again, going back, even though it seems like a very small thing, uh, the version and the date for each budget. Uh, next, I want to talk about timeline. So general approaches for the timeline, I highly encourage everyone to work backwards from a due date. Um, you're going to start with when you want something to be done um, and then think about each stage in which um, is part of that particular task and work backwards to the very beginning. That is 100% the best way to do it. Um, I will also say that I strongly believe in building in some buffer time for particular tasks. So I found for myself that oftentimes writing and coordination take a little extra time. And I will, I will say coordination right now in particular during COVID takes a little extra time. So for me, I always build in an extra day, for example, for writing or for coordination, knowing that most likely the, that time is gonna be eaten up by, you know, for writing revisions um, or whatever it may be, for coordination, just getting in touch with people. Um, and I do think that when people are building a budget, the number one biggest pitfall is that they don't, they do it in a silo and that they don't consider their own work or personal calendars. Um, if you build out a project timeline um, that, you know, it, it can look very beautiful, it can be very accurate, but in all reality, a lot of project work for people happens, you know, after work or on the weekends. And you really need to consider about how it's going to interact with your own personal workload, uh, whether that be wherever that might look like. So I really encourage you when you're looking at your timeline, look at your personal and your work calendars and really think through, am I going to be able to get, you know, if I already have a very busy work day and a very busy old personal day, how am I going to be able to write, you know, a grant that day? Be realistic about what you can do. There's only 24 hours um, in a day. And, you know, I think that the biggest thing is you don't want to burn yourself out. You don't want to set unrealistic expectations for you and your project um, that meet, ultimately you cannot meet. So I think a big part of creating a successful project timeline is making sure you're really considering, um, you know, your own your own time personally and work-wise. Um, there are a couple of different timelines that I think are most helpful. Um, oh, sorry, I did want to go back really quickly and say I on that last note, I do think the best way to approach uh, work in a project is to a little bit often. So I am a big fan of setting aside um, an hour a day to work on a project. So uh, my project right now is my dissertation. Um, and so for example, I've set aside from seven to 8 a.m. every morning, um, I'm going to work on my dissertation. Um, for me at least, it makes, it, it makes me be consistent and it keeps it top of mind. Um, instead of, you know, sometimes I feel like if you uh, plan on doing 14 hours of work in one day, that can be very intimidating. Um, and it's, again, just not very realistic. So I also think that that has been very important for me when I work on projects. What we're looking at right here is a sample project timeline. So it has date, project milestone, uh, who is responsible in notes. Um, obviously the dates, you know, it's kind of the core piece of the timeline. Again, you need to work backwards from your deadline. Um, second is the project milestone or task. Um, I really like being very specific in what the milestone or task is. So you can see here, for example, I've called out, you know, meeting one, meeting two, um, when you should be following up um, with community stakeholders about emailing. I really believe that pretty much every task, that being more specific with your tasks and putting those on the calendar um, really creates a really viable roadmap for getting your project done. I think the other thing that's key to this is calling out who is responsible for that task. I think oftentimes we create tasks or you know, things that need to happen in a project um, but if we, if, you know, no one is being held responsible, um, for those tasks, they're just not going to happen. Um, so make sure whenever you're creating a timeline, you call out who is responsible for that. And then the second piece of that is making sure that person knows they are responsible for that. So that is to say, make sure you're sharing out your timelines 
uh, with people on your team or important stakeholders so they understand what they're responsible for and when. Um, and then lastly, of course, I love my notes. So there's a notes column there. And a lot of times I think that it's uh, most effectively used for calling out the purposes of a meeting. Like, I don't know about all of you, but I don't need more meetings in my life. So being very clear about what those meetings are going to be about. Um, so everyone is again on the same page and also so you're not, you know, unnecessarily, you know, creating events or tasks, um, I think is really helpful. And this is just one way you can create a timeline. Um, I think the most important part here is again, the idea of it living, you know, in a silo. Um, your timeline should be integrated into your calendar or into whatever it is that you look at daily or regularly. Because if you have a PDF of a timeline, that's really great and I'm sure it looks really beautiful. Um, but if it's not integrated into your daily life or what you're looking at, then it's most likely that those things are just not going to happen. Uh, so that is to say, you can create a timeline and I think it's very helpful the more, the larger and more complicated your projects are. But at the very least, what you should be doing is putting these things on your calendar. Um, if you want to do both, go ahead. Um, I often find that, you know, it's start with, you know, make sure at the very least it's on your calendar and you can get kind of like the same sort of format or layout if you want here. Um, I know in Google calendars, at least, if you go to like schedule mode, um, I highly recommend that in that case, you create um, a separate project calendar in Google. Um, and that way you can share it out. That way you have a little bit more flexibility for what it looks like. I did want to quickly share too um, that we, for some visual learners and also uh, for artists in particular, there is something called Gantt charts. Um, and I think that that's just really helpful in terms of visualizing um, you know, the actual schedule. So essentially we have the exact same thing we had in the last slide. Um, and here we have a visualization of how long or how many dates it's going to take. Um, and I find oftentimes, again, that's really helpful for artists for very complicated projects, um, very fast paced projects. It's very helpful in being able to communicate exactly what's going on. Um, the next part of this is coordination. So this is really the idea that within your small team as you're doing your project, you're going, need, going to need to start coordinating um, requests and requests can be anything from um, asking for an in-kind donation, trying to find volunteers um, or, or hiring a contractor, whatever it may be. But the idea is that you're going to need help. Like you are most likely for your project, it's not going to be just you producing the entire project. At some point in time, you're going to need to, going to, need to communicate externally um, to team members or other stakeholders um, and communication should happen frequently um, and it should also happen in the preferred method um, of whomever it is you're communicating with. I think that that's very important. Um, you know, if someone is really good at text but really suck at emails, then you should, you know, make note of that and communicate with that person through text. Um, it's going to save you both a whole lot of headache and time. Um, second thing is that I think you, something that I find often in small projects is that requests are made really informally or maybe not even made at all. And I think that that really is to the detriment of the project. Um, I think that the more, I think that creating really specific and even sometimes what I think people call formal uh, requests for help um, is, you know, it's one, increasing the chances of accountability. I think it's really, you know, about setting expectations, boundaries and respecting one another's times and contributions. Um, I think oftentimes when we work with friends or with people we know well, you know, we'll, we could shoot them a text and say, hey, I'm gonna be working on this project, do you wanna do it? And we don't necessarily, we're not very clear in communicating all the specific details of the project. So that is to say, whenever you make external communicate, or whenever you're communicating with stakeholders or other people on the team, um, I think it's really important that you're very specific about the project itself so they understand what it is they're getting into. Um, your request needs to cover what, when, and how, so what being either the specific roles or responsibilities that you would ask a contractor or a volunteer to do or your ask. So if that is, you know, you're asking for an in-kind beer donation, you're very specific about what you're asking for. Um, when you need to be very specific about the start date, end date or key dates. So I need it by this time. I wanna pick it up by this date, whatever that may be. And then how is a little bit more flexible if that's important to you and your project then make sure to include that. Um, I think the thing that drives me most crazy and probably lots of people is oftentimes compensation or acknowledgement is not necessarily uh, communicated, especially early on in the project. 
Um, so I think it's very important to be clear about the communication or acknowledgement um, or the type of acknowledgement you might be giving, for example, an in-kind donor. You know, we'll, we'll be blasting out, um, and, you know, your logo or something on something. Um, and then lastly, your contact information. Um, and I do want to point out really quickly um, under what specific roles and responsibilities. I think one of the most important things there is letting people know um, how long they're going to, you know, what the expectations are in terms of time. Uh, I really want to mention really quickly, a bit, another big thing that saved me a whole lot of work is a sample, uh, is a contact list. Um, I think oftentimes there's lots of moving parts and people. So this helps you keep track of everything. Um, and like I said earlier, um, you'll, you'll notice in the notes section, um, I often term, times make notes of, um, you know, the best ways of, best ways to communicate with people when they're out of the office, et cetera. So, you know, um, you can go back and reference that. Uh, last, or this is the last part of it and it's tracking. Um, so what can you track? There's a couple different things to track whenever you're working on a project. Um, one is hours and there are a bunch of free apps. You can get Toggle, Clockify, Harvest, et cetera. Um, or you can even make your own timesheet. Um, my timesheet is actually like in my notes section of my phone, uh, especially if you're out and about, that can be really helpful. But I think hourly tracking is really important um, because one, it does, it is important in terms of time, um, in terms of your budget. Um, but two, I think actually I am more interested in tracking my time because it makes me, uh, estimate my time more accurately in the future. Um, so if I'm working on a project, uh, a similar project in a month or whatever, I can say, you know what, it doesn't take me five hours to do that. It actually takes me 10 and it just helps you, um, start to understand your ways of working and you know, how much time you need to do something. Um, the other thing to track are receipts. I feel so strongly about this. I have so many receipts in my life. Um, I would say the first thing is to either decide if you wanna stick with paper or email. Um, I actually prefer paper um, and that's because as soon as I get it, I can write on it exactly what it's for. So, you know, if it's, you know, coffee with this person, I'll write that on it. And oftentimes I'll often write the project name as well, especially if I have multiple projects going on at once. Um, and then I immediately take a picture of it um, and then I will put it in a full file folder immediately. Like literally I have a folder in my bag or my book bag that I will then put that receipt into. Um, I think the most important thing about this is that you do it as soon as possible. So like literally if I walk out of a store and I have receipts from that store, I will go in my car and the first thing I do are all these steps. Uh, the longer you leave it, the more likely it is that you're gonna forget what that receipt was for, um, what project it was for, et cetera. Um, and then really quickly, Something that has served me really well in terms of tracking is tracking decisions, tracking major, major decisions within a project. Uh, this is called a decision log. And the idea is that you're really tracking um, uh, how, when, and why decisions were made throughout a project. Um, it's imp especially important for really big decisions and I think really works well for large and complicated uh, projects. Um, I also wanna say that it's been, it's been a lifesaver, especially when I'm working with uh, clients or stakeholders who can be a little troublesome. Um, this is often a really good way to make sure that everyone um, understands um, why a decision was made. And if ever within the project, you find that decision has impacted um, the project development, you can go back and say, well, we all agreed on this decision at this point in time for the, these reasons. Um, and that's, you know, we, and so you can kind of, you have um, kind of a paper trail, if you will, um, of how you got where you are. And frankly, it holds a lot of people accountable. Um, lastly, sample talking, uh, pardon me, sample document tracking. Um, I think oftentimes we have lots and lots of different documents that are part of our uh, project. So this is just a really simple spreadsheet. Um, it names the document itself, the status and the notes um, of where those documents are. Um, you know, I think especially when you're applying for things, letters of support, resumes, et cetera, those can often be difficult to track or difficult to keep on top of. So I find that this is a really effective and easy way uh, to do that. And then lastly, just some quick ways of working. Um, I really believe in living plans and that means um, that you don't make a plan and set it on the shelf and it gathers dust throughout your project, that you continue to return to it, um, that really it guides your work. And the way you do that is making sure you stay organized, you be consistent, and that really equals an up-to-date plan. Um, like I talked about for the receipts or anything else here, it's really about um, making sure, I think for me at least, as soon as something comes up on my plate, I make sure I do that thing. Um, I make sure that I'm proactive, I, maybe is a good way to put it.
Uh, the second thing is to share and collaborate. Uh, you know, if you're the only person who knows a plan, it's a personal plan, it's not a project plan. You need to be able to communicate out and share uh, your plan with others. Um, be realistic. Um, I think actually it might be more appropriate to say be kind and be understanding <laughs> than maybe be realistic or they're kind of one and the same here. Again, it kind of goes back to the idea that especially if you're doing project work nights and weekends, um, you need to make sure that um, you are being kind and understanding of your time and others' time on the project. Um, and that, you know, sometimes it's going to take more time to do something um, and you need to be able to set realistic boundaries and expect expectations for yourself. Uh, lastly, take it one step at a time. Um, I've given you some tools um, that can be a little intimidating and so can project planning itself can be a little overwhelming and intimidating. So something I would suggest is visualize your project from start to finish, create a list of it. And if you're having trouble about where to start in terms of project planning, just pick one very specific task, uh, you know, be very, very focused and let that guide, you know, be the first place you start in your budget, for example, whether that be personnel or whether that be materials, um, make sure that you really, you can really focus in and uh, be able to kind of wrap your head around the project itself. I think if you really focus on one part of it, again, do a little bit every day. Um, and then lastly, ask for help. Um, you know, projects, like I said, oftentimes happen with other people and teamwork. And if you um, know your own strengths and weaknesses, then make sure you're asking for help with your weaknesses or even your strengths if it's just a big and complicated project. All right, I am over time. Um, but to be honest, there's so much more I could say about projects. I love them or planning and projects. Um, are there any, any questions? Oh, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, anyone that has questions, feel free to type them in the chat. If we are a little over time, so if you need to be somewhere, feel free to, to head out. But Liz and I will stick around here a little bit longer yeah. to chat. Um, Liz, I had a question you said at the beginning, um, you used the word scope as a verb. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about how, how I can bring that to my organization and say, we need to scope this out. And how do I say what that means? Um, I think that timelines and budgets are the most helpful tools for scoping. Um, because I think a lot of times, like I said, that's where the rubber hits the road. So if you're being very ambitious and you're like, oh, well, we're going to serve 400 people. Um, whenever you get to your budget, you start to understand, wow, there are real limitations in, in us being able to achieve that goal. Um, so oftentimes I think about scoping as a verb in terms of being able to point to how much it's going to cost and how much time it's going to take. Um, because I, you know, when we're in our ideation phase, um, it's, it's fun and great not to have those constraints. Um, so I really think about it in terms of creating those things. Eileen, <clears throat> Eileen says we should have a help group for project planning, <laughs> like a study group. That's a good idea. I wonder if they have something like that at, at Cortex or, you know, Cortex has the Venture Cafe. Maybe they do something along those lines, but we should maybe think about that too. Yes, definitely. I All think, right. Liz, you've, you've made people a little busy here. <laughs> they see some action steps that they need to get to work on. That's great. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for sticking with us through uh, a, a Zoom outage <laughs> and being over time. <laughs> all right. Well, if there are no more questions, thanks again for attending today. And we hope to see you next month. It's February 10th. And we'll be with our board member, Angie Villa, to learn about artist residencies. Thanks, everyone. Take care.